start our week than worshiping our God as a church family. say I'm glad you're in church today <laughs> man what a gift it is to be here together to remind ourselves of the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ that has so transformed my life has transformed your life today we're gonna continue to sing in just a minute I just want to welcome those of you who may be new here um, it is an honor to have you here church family can you help me welcome everyone who may be new here for the first time thank you for being here thank you for checking us out today I'd love for you to do something. If this is your first time, I'd love for you to take me up on this. Just open up your phone. You can do this right now or at any point in the service. Open up a, a text to 23101. Send the word new. And we just want to know who you are. We'd love to be connected with you. And we'd also love to send you a little bit of a, uh, a gift card on us to get some coffee. We just, we're so grateful that you're here. 
and uh, we're gonna have a, a fun time today. Before we get uh, into our service, um, there's something that we just, we, we could not just pass up the opportunity to tell you guys what God's been doing in our students. So a couple of weeks ago, we had an uncommon conference. That's what we called it, a common conference where our students came together to worship. Well, the Wednesday after that, this last Wednesday, um, the Holy Spirit moved. Guys, 47 students followed Jesus in water baptism. And this is one of the measurements, right? This is one of the ways that we can see that God is real and that He's at work in our church whenever we see people taking steps towards Jesus Christ. And so what we're gonna do that today is we're gonna celebrate some more people who are taking a very similar step. And so as we sing today, you'll see them on the screen. They're gonna be baptized. When they come up out of the water, we just wanna show them our support as their church family. We wanna show them our love by hooting, by hollering, and just praising Jesus. But before we get into the rest of our service, can you just open up your hands to heaven with me? If you want to, if you feel comfortable, just raise your hands. And let's just say thank you to God. God, thank you for being so good. Thank you for being a real God who is moving in our real church right now. Your spirit is here. And we believe you want to speak to us right now. God, we honor you. We're here to worship you. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. Let's continue to sing together.
worship you, Jesus. We carry as your church your death, your crucifixion. We carry your resurrection, lifting our eyes to you in hope and in worship. Be honored by our singing today, Jesus. Be honored, Jesus. With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified
First Peter says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into a marvelous light. We once had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And friends, when we get to gather like this and worship, we exist to praise Him, and we exist to baptize new people that are giving their allegiance and saying, you are my God, you are my Savior, and may we not grow apathetic to seeing people baptized into the family of God. May we be reminded regularly of the 47 kids who gave their lives to Jesus and were baptized, of the many who are baptized today. Gang, this is why we're a church, to teach people loyalty to Jesus, to give people their heart. And Lord, we give you praise this morning. God, we worship you. Lord, we thank you that we get to gather together as your people, a holy nation, your own special people. Lord, this is what you've brought us together to do, to worship you, to bring people to know you, to follow you, to make you their Lord. And Lord, we get to worship you this morning and proclaim your goodness in our life. God, we thank you for it. And we give you one more shout of praise this morning. Give him glory, give him praise. Man, it was so good to worship with you this morning. Hey, do this for me. Turn around, welcome somebody around you uh, to church. Say thanks for being here. And then you can have a seat. Man, so good to see you guys this weekend. Thanks for hanging out with us. I want to say a special welcome to anybody that's watching online this weekend. And as Jordan said, if you're new, text that same number to 23101. We'll get you a cup of coffee on us. But here's your next step. Uh, we, we don't believe that you're made to just attend here at Church on the Move. Uh, we believe you're made to be a part. This is why we have things like groups, mid-sized groups, Bible studies, all of our classes, and then also different ways for you to get involved around here. We have several different volunteer spots open actually right now. So one of the best places for you to start is at Next Move. And if you'd like to get connected to that, do this for us. Text NEXT to 23101, check out your phone, text NEXT and get signed up for Next Move, which is happening the last weekend of the month. It happens once a month around here. We will have one on Saturday night as well as Sunday morning, last weekend in August. We would love to get you connected to that. Well, hey, it is a special weekend. We're wrapping up our Psalm series today with Psalm 119. Pastor Witt will be teaching on that in a moment. But we also have a special mission partner and friend of ours. Back in February, we asked you at the start of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we asked for your support in helping one of our mission partners. Uh, we came to you, his name is Oleg, he leads New Hope Eurasia based in Moldova, but does a lot of work in Romania and Ukraine right in that area. And we asked for you guys to respond by sending $100,000 to just help aid his work in advancing the gospel in a very war-torn area. As you can imagine, you've been seeing this on the news. And you responded not just with $100,000, but actually exceeded giving him over $200,000, which is incredible. And part of what we've been able to do over the last few months is help get him um, over to the States recently to get his family a little bit of R&R. &R. And also we wanted to give him the opportunity just to share a little bit with you about what's going on. And he is with us this morning. So would you join me in welcoming Pastor Oleg to the stage? Man. Thank you, church. Oleg, man, you guys have been busy. <laughs> you've been, you were just telling us so many more stories backstage about everything that you've been doing over the past few months. But would you just share a little bit with our congregation, a little bit about what their generosity has been able to enable you guys to do? You know, Church on the Move, you are an amazing church. We're so honored to be able to partner with a church that is super generous. Your generosity, it's a God-sized generosity. Your prayers is such an amazing thing that supports us, that keeps us going. Thank you, church. You know, February 24th, we realized that our airspace in the country is closed. We heard of the first bombs that handed up in Ukraine. 
And my wife is born there. One of the cities is heavily being bombed right now. They're wiping the city. You know, we ran, we drove to the, to the border of Moldova and Ukraine to look at opportunities that what we have there to serve. As we saw moms and babies run, walk through the borders with the little belongings that they had left. I said, I looked in my wife's eyes and I said, Marina, we got to do something for these moms. Yeah. We got to do something for these kids. And it took us on a journey, you know, a journey of helping, rescuing, you know, all kind of service that we were able to provide. Let me share with you just a little bit of that. We had been running evacuation ministry, you know, efforts. My wife has been evacuating thousands of women with kids, organizing buses. Yeah. We had to organize rescue missions inside Ukraine to send people yeah. to go right in the forests where people were in the towns, you know, in the cellars, in the bombing shelters, yeah. asking us to come and rescue them out of there. My heroes are the pastor's wives. Men are not, were not allowed to travel to drive because they would be taken to the yeah. army right away. The wives of the pastors would send them the money for their petrol yeah. and so yeah. they would get in the car and drive into those areas where Russian army on one side, Russian, Ukrainian army on the other side, rescue out of there, bring them to the buses. And my wife would transport those buses farther to Moldova and farther west. I'm so honored to say how appreci I much appreciate this woman. And you know what? Then to get them at the borders, we were able to welcome 1.2 million people. 1.2 million people. Moldova became a shelter to so many people. You know, guys, Moldova per capita took more refugees than any country on the planet since the Second World War. But none of that help would have been possible with your, without your generosity. For 52 days, no Red Cross, no UNHCR, nobody else. We learned from just what happened. You know, we set up the, t the tents, offered hot meals, water, you know, all the supplies, hygienic supplies, baby formula, diapers, everything, and the Bibles, and the Word. You know, all the prayers. We gave everything in the name of Jesus. Our border guards, they said they have never heard the name of Jesus for so many times in their life. Because everything we gave was all in the name of Jesus. Let the name of Jesus be glorified yeah. and magnified. Yeah. Thank you, church. Amen. We appreciate you so much for the honor and the opportunity to be able to, you know, provide the meals to the yes. people. Yes. Now we have an ongoing work with shelters, distribution of food places. Yes. And you know, one of the largest in the country distribution of food, it actually was run by the Communist Party. Now, none of the companies can give food away. We have to buy it all. Yeah. That's why we needed your financial support. Yeah. In Moldova and Ukraine, it's illegal to give food away. But this was a call from the communists. You know, communists are the people who don't believe in God, don't love the Bible, hate God's people. Now, to get a call from them was very special. Yeah. This lady, Irene, she calls me in and says, Mr. Oleg, we know New Hope and we know what you've done. You've trained yeah. our social workers. You, you trained our schools. You, we, we know you. Would you step up for these people? And I said, what exactly? And she said, we need food. We need hygienic supplies. I said, how many? They said, in one distribution center, just 1,300 women, moms and little babies yeah. that need your help. And I said, okay. Can, well, we have other things that we want to ask you back. I said, if I give it all in the name of Jesus, is it okay? Pause. <laughs> I said, okay. If I pray with these women, you know, out just up in the open air, is it okay? Pause. So the last thing I want to ask you, ma'am, is it okay if we give freely Bibles unconditionally? And she, you can have it. Yeah. Praise yeah. the Lord. Yeah. And now we can pray with people, love on people, give the word. 98 tons of food was given there. You know, 10,000 Bibles are put in the hands of the people. Awesome. And it's all because of Church on the Move. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Man, that's awesome. Hey. Before you leave, your work is really just beginning in a lot of ways. You've got a lot going on in the next few weeks. Can I, I wanna pray for you, but I also wanna do something. Can I invite the family up real quick? I would love to invite your whole family, your kids, your special wife. Pastor Blake Witt, do you guys wanna join me real quick? 
Hey, we're just going to have a moment where we pray over this family. I feel just led to do this this morning. If you'll do this with me, stretch out your hand towards these guys. We've got, they've got a big couple of weeks coming up, a lot of travel. We're going to believe for God's protection on this family. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for Oleg, for this precious family, Lord, all of his children. Lord, they are living out the gospel. Lord, what they're doing, they are the hands and feet. Lord, we are able to send them through our generosity. Lord, you've called us to be able to send people like Oleg. So Lord, we thank you for it. Lord, we ask for special provision, protection on this family. Lord, supernaturally sustain them. Lead Oleg by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, send your angels to protect him as he enters into very difficult places. And Lord, as Oleg said, may Jesus be magnified. May he be uh, seen as Lord in this life and in this situation. So Lord, we thank you for it. God, continue to work. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Amen. Give it up for Oleg's family one more time. Well, guys, as we do every week around here, at the end of our worship, we take an opportunity to worship God with our tithes, with our offerings. And, you know, part of what we give around here goes to uh, funding several different mission partners. If you want to give with us today, you can do that by texting GIVE to 23101. You can also give via cash or check by dropping those off at the doors today. And for those of you that would like to continue to support our Compassion Offering, which is above and beyond our tithe and goes to supporting our mission partners all around the world, just like Oleg, and also help send our, our student team, which is in Mexico right now on another missions trip. Uh, they just left yesterday. All of that you can give to CO, which is for Compassion Offering text that to 23101. I'll say a quick prayer over our giving and then we'll get into our message. Lord, thank you for everything that we're giving today sacrificially. Lord, I thank you that you've been able to use us to help people like Oleg, to help all of our different mission partners all around the world. Thank you, Lord, for calling us, for using us as the people of God to move the gospel forward. Lord, we thank you for it. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good to see everybody tonight. Glad you guys are here. Let me look into the camera and welcome everybody watching online and our churches at Dick Connor and Eddie Warrior. They're part of our church family. Can we welcome them this weekend as well? God bless you guys. Glad to have you. Hey, before I jump in tonight, I want to kind of give you a preview of what's coming up in the next couple of weeks. Two weeks from this weekend, I'm starting a new series working through the book of Ephesians. I, I love Ephesians. Maybe there's no more potent uh, formulation of the gospel than in Ephesians. But what I love about Ephesians is this combination of kind of theological richness and depth and practical outworking in a community. And so we want to kind of look at the nature of the gospel and then see how we respond. What's, what's cool about it is Paul goes into all of this depth about who we are in Christ and then he works that out practically. What does it mean to be the people of God, the community of God, the family of God? And uh, I think it's gonna kind of set us up really great for this fall and where, honestly, I think the Lord is leading us. And then next weekend, just before I get into Ephesians, uh, Becky Pippert is gonna be speaking. Some of you might remember Becky as she was here a couple of years ago, in fact, pre-pandemic. She is amazing. One of my favorite Bible teachers, authors. She is brilliant, and she's gonna be sharing next weekend. I don't want you to miss it, so please be here to hear from her because I'm telling you, you will love her. If you haven't heard her yet, you will come away. She's got the best stories, but she's a brilliant mind, and uh, she's excited, her and her husband, Dick, to be able to be here, and uh, I just love our church family, and we've kind of fallen in love with them, so we're uh, excited they're in town, and I asked her to be able to, if she was able to speak, and she was, so I I'm just thrilled. So anyways, uh, that's coming up in, in a couple of weeks. This week, we're wrapping up. Uh, our series on the Psalms. By the way, last weekend, my dad's message, if you missed it, it was amazing. Best message of the series as far as I'm concerned. It was so good. Yeah. So good. In fact, I called Heather on the way home and I said, Dad, she heard it. And I was like, that, that message was incredible. She said it was. And I said, yeah, I'm going to have to step my game up. And do you know how she responded? She said, yeah, you are. What are you talking about? You're supposed to be my wife. Back me up, woman. Anyway, I am motivated tonight, needless to say, to bring the word. So if you're ready, Psalm 119. Do you have a Bible? Turn there. We're going to look at the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 
verses. But it's not just the psalmist rambling on and on about lots of different things. In fact, Psalm 119 is really just about one thing. It's 176 verses of the same theme over and over and over again. The psalmist is declaring, extolling the beauty, the wonder, the riches of the scriptures themselves. It's interesting to me that Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, is a poem. And it's not a poem about a passionate love affair. It's not a poem about marriage, family. It's not a poem about a beautiful sunset or the wonders of creation. It's a poem about the Bible itself. I want to read to you just a few verses out of Psalm 119. We're not going to go through all 176, but I just want to share a few of them with you that kind of highlight the theme. In fact, you're going to see over and over again, David or the writer of this psalm uses around eight different words to refer to the word of God. Precepts, testimonies, statutes, rules, law, all of these are synonyms for the scriptures, for God's words given to man. We'll begin in verse 12. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight, listen to this, as much as in all riches. Verse 33, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments for I delight in it. We'll skip ahead to verse 93, I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. Verse 103, how sweet are your words to my taste. You can feel the passion and the emotion. This is not some just sort of dry uh, exposition about how much he loves God's word. No, this is filled with passion. He says, oh goodness, I lost my place. Here we go. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Uh, Verse 129, your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. Verse 131, I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this text. So much we learn here. I pray, Father, that the word you have given me tonight, you would help me to speak it with clarity, boldness, and confidence for this people here and now. Holy Spirit, have your way. Do what you need to do in this congregation. I pray that our hearts and ears would be open to hear from you, to be changed by you, to sit under the authority of your word, to sit submitted to it so that we can be changed more into the image of Christ. That is our goal. We thank you for accomplishing it in us. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. Amen. I think the American church is in the middle of an epidemic, and no, I'm not talking about COVID. I think there's another epidemic going on. It's not spread by a virus, it's, 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 it's really a different kind of epidemic, and I think it strikes at the very foundation, the very core of what gives the church its strength. I'm talking about biblical illiteracy. I've had this conversation so many times with pastor after pastor after pastor who was shocked at the way their congregation responded to 2020. The fear, the panic, the fighting and infighting and suspicion, it made so many of them question, what have we been accomplishing all of these years? What kind of disciples, when they looked at the type of disciple they had been forming, they saw a weak, frail, fragile, thin, if you will, kind of disciple. Church, if we're going to be the kind of people we need to be, the kind of people who can endure tough times, the kind of people who, like we just sang, can stand strong in the midst of adversity, we're going to have to be a people deeply shaped by Scripture. Have to be. It is the foundation of who we are. It's not just an option. It's not a luxury. Scripture is the foundation of what forms and makes the people of God. I want to talk about three things then 
tonight that emerged for me out of Psalm 119. First is the necessity of Scripture. Second is the authority of Scripture. And third, we'll wrap up with the freedom of Scripture, the necessity, the authority, and the freedom. Let's talk first about the necessity of Scripture. Scripture, as I just said, is not an optional extra in the Christian life. It is the foundation. It's the starting point for a relationship with God. I might say it to you like this. The primary way that God has chosen to reveal himself is through his word. I want to say that again. The primary way doesn't mean it's the only way, but it is the primary way. It takes supremacy over all other ways. The primary way the, that, that God has chosen to reveal himself to us is through his word. That means that when we approach the scriptures, we have to let the scriptures take priority over every other experience that we have with God. I might say it like this, we prioritize the word over our feelings about God. I'm going to say more about this in just a few minutes in point number two when I talk about the authority of scripture, but I'll just say really quickly here that we don't get to bring our feelings of what we would like God to be to the text or to the scriptures and allow our feelings or thoughts or preferences, whether they be personal or cultural, to shape who God is. No, rather what we do is we sit under scripture and allow scripture to form our thoughts and feelings and opinions about who God is. So we prioritize our, uh, the word of God over our feelings. We prioritize the word of God over our experiences with God. Now this goes a little deeper. What does that mean? It means that no matter what you experience, wherever it may be, whether that's at your home, in a church service, someone laying hands on you at a mountaintop, whatever you experience with God or some supposed experience with God has to be submitted to the supremacy of Scripture. In other words, there will be nothing that you experience with God that should contradict what is revealed about God in Scripture. Any experience that we have with God should then be subjected or weighed or viewed through the lens of Scripture and corrected through that lens. We don't get to have sort of extra biblical experiences with God that then sort of impose a, a priority on the word of God. Rather, we correct or view our experiences through the lens of the word of God. So we have to prioritize that. Lastly, we prioritize, this one even goes a little bit further and is personal for me, we prioritize the word of God over sermons about God. What does that mean? It means that we have to weigh even the teaching of God's word against what we read in scripture. Paul said something fascinating in Galatians chapter one. In fact, I want to read this in verse eight. He said this. He said, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. In other words, and this is fascinating, here already Paul recognized that the gospel that he had been bringing was authoritative on the same level with Scripture. Of course, now we know that that gospel is Scripture because we have it in a, a, an organized canon and we can look at it down through the lens of history. But at this time, it, it, it wasn't in that place. But Paul recognized that the revelation that God had given him was at the same level as Scripture. It's a unique thing. It wasn't, isn't happening again in human history. God did it in that time and the door is closed on all of that, all right? But Paul is saying, look, if, if I show up, this is crazy, Paul says, if, if you even hear it from me or an angel, in other words, if you have some kind of a vision, some sort of an experience with God, but that vision or experience with some angelic being contradicts scripture, Paul says, let them be accursed. That's amazing when you think about it. That's the priority that we're to give to the scriptures. It takes priority over our feelings. It takes priority over our experiences. It takes priority over what we hear preached even sometimes. It needs to. We have to put scripture above all else. The priority of scripture. What does scripture then give us? What does it provide for us? Well, when you read through Psalm 119, there's a whole host of benefits. I wanna just share 
a few of these benefits with you. Uh, it, scripture brings light to darkness, verse 105. Clarity to confusion, Psalm 119, verse 113. Comfort to the fearful, uh, verse 39. Strength to those in sorrow, verse 28. Understanding to the simple, verse 130. Salvation to the soul, verse 81. Hope to the hopeless, verse 81b. Uh, life to the afflicted, verse 91. Sight to the blind, verse 18. Leadership to the leaderless, verse 35. An answer for the critics, verse 42. Honor for the ashamed, verse 46. A shelter for the attacked, verse 114. Freedom from the bondage of iniquity and sin, verse 133. Delight to the diligent, verse 143. And peace for the journey, verse 165. God gave us his word so that we could know him. I, I tell people this from time to time. God wrote a book, he didn't make a movie. Unfortunately, he didn't make a Netflix series. The Chosen is great, but it's not scripture. He wrote a book, but I don't like to read. Tough. We don't get to come to God negotiating. Why did you write this book and write it all these years ago? I, I don't really enjoy reading. Think of the audacity that we human beings have to sort of look at God and go, well, I, I just really don't like reading all that much. So I couldn't be bothered to read the book that you wrote. We have to submit ourselves, and I'm going to talk about this here in a second, to the authority of Scripture, which means embracing Scripture in the form and manner in which God provides it. Which means, if you don't like to read, guess what you get to do? You get to learn to like to read Scripture. We submit to it, not try to form it to our preferences. So you need Scripture it is the way you will know God. I, I'll even go a step further. I will say the primary metric, I would say, for how you will mature in Christ will be directly related to how much time you spend in this book. You're, nothing else will form you. Nothing else will shape you. Nothing else will mature you and grow you like time that you spend, I'm not talking about borrowed time. I, I love, sir, I'm preaching right now. There's value in this, but this is not a replacement for you, you, you spending time in this book. You need it. So I am on a mission at COTM to elevate biblical literacy. This is why we do Bible studies like we do. This is why we started COTMU, because it's not enough just for me to know the Bible. We need to know the Bible. We've got to get into this and be people of the book. When, when and only when we're people of the book will we see our faith start to mature, strengthen, and deepen, and we'll be people who can weather any kind of storm. But it all comes back to this book. Can I get an amen, church on the move? So the necessity of Scripture. Let me talk for a second now about the authority of Scripture. And I've been talking a little bit about this. But the authority of Scripture means that we come submissively to the, to the text. When we read Scripture, we show up humbly. Over and over and over again, in fact, I, I, I highlighted them. I want to just read them to you. I want you to notice how many times, this isn't even all of them, I think there's 14 times, the psalmist refers to himself in Psalm 119 as your servant or slave. The words are interchangeable. Verse 49, remember your word to your servant in which you have made me hope. Verse 76, let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise to your servant, there it is again, verse 124, deal with your servant according to your steadfast love and teach me your statutes, verse 125, I am your servant, give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. Over and over and over again, the psalmist rightly posits himself or postures himself as a servant, meaning there's a master and I'm not the master, I'm the servant, I'm the one in, in, in submission, in the submissive pose here, or the submissive position. You know, this echoes what you find all through the New Testament, by the way. When you read the letters of Paul, he over and over and over again, do you know how he refers to himself? 
as a servant, oftentimes a bond servant. I, I, I brought a few verses from here. In fact, Paul opens many of his letters with this kind of language. Paul, Romans 1, a servant of Christ Jesus. Look at Philippians 1, Paul and Timothy, who are we? We're servants of Christ Jesus. How about Philemon 1.1, 1, 1. Paul takes it even a step further, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. How about John? Even John the Apostle gets in the act in Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to who? His servants, the things which must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. These are all positions of posture and relationship. In other words, when I show up to the scriptures, I'm not the master, I'm the servant. That means that I have to allow scripture to shape my imagination, my thoughts, my feelings, rather than the other way around. It means then that what God thinks about everything, from money, to relationships, to love, marriage, sexuality, gender, divorce, all of it is, I have to subject my opinions to all of this, even when I don't like them, even when I don't understand, even when it feels culturally funky or insensitive even, I have to subject my opinion to what scripture says. I, I had an experience with this um, just last week during Uncommon, our, our student conference. Phenomenal. I had a, such a great time. I was sitting there on, what was it, Friday night, Nathan Finocchio was preaching, and he is phenomenal. Kids, they, he just, it was a wonderful service. He talked about holiness, which is great at a youth conference. Not exactly the topic that one would think of to speak to youth about, but it was fantastic. And he was sharing about how you don't just get to worship God any old way that you want to. Jesus said, you'll worship me in spirit and in truth. In other words, you, you don't come to God just how you like. God has a protocol, a way of worshiping him. We see this in the story of Cain and Abel, for instance. Abel brings his best, Cain brings kind of his leftovers, and God's like, yeah, not interested. God doesn't just accept whatever it is that we bring him. We have to worship him in spirit and in truth. So he's sharing some of these stories. In fact, he talked about Uzzah. Do you know the story of Uzzah in 2 Samuel where Uzzah, the, the ark's being transported, and, and it's in an ox cart, and Uzzah reaches out his hand and touches the ark because the ox have, oxen have stumbled and the ark's about to fall over and he touches the ark and it says the, that the power of God comes out of the ark and Uzzah dies. It's one of those weird passages Nathan was talking about. And he was like, what, why, is, why is Uzzah being killed here? Because this is not how you carry the ark of the covenant. This is not how you carry royalty. You don't get to treat God however you want, whenever you you know, carry royalty around. You know, the, you've seen it in the movies where they have the little poles and they put them in the, the, the little carrier for the royal people and they're back there with their grapes and they got the four servants and they're, you, you've seen this, you know what I'm talking about. They've got the Ark of the Covenant in an ox cart. I like the way Nathan said it. He's like, you're gonna throw the Ark of the Covenant in the back of your janky Ford F-150? <laughs> you don't get to treat God. You don't get to worship God however you want. He was talking about how we have to come to God with, this, with the right posture. In fact, one of the things that he said and I thought was so powerful is, you know that only two times in all, of the, in all of the scriptures, God is referred to as love, twice. He's called holy over 400 times. It doesn't mean that God isn't love. It just means that we, we are far more comfortable with a God of love than we are with a holy God. And so he said, when you're going to worship God, you've got to come the way that he asks you to come to him. And then he started talking about, how does God want to be worshipped? Well, if God says, raise your hands in worship, which he does, Paul talks about it in 2 Timothy. He says, I, I, I would, the ev men everywhere would come lifting holy hands. He said, then guess what you need to do in worship? You lift your hands. Now, right there, that's where it got me. Because to be honest with you, when I worship, I forever, I don't prefer to raise my hands. I have my reasons. I'm six foot five. Do you know how high this is? <laughs> this is like nine feet in the air. And I'm an introvert. And I would just rather kind of keep my hands. And I'm also a little bit of a contrarian. So when the worship leaders are like, I want everybody in this room to raise their hands, guess what I'm doing? Not me. You can't make me. I won't do it. 
I'll just worship God right here, just kind of like this, this little <laughs> vibe thing going on. I don't get to do that. I, I, I heard that night, I'm like, whoa. If God wants me to raise my hands, then guess what I'm doing? Raising my hands. So this last weekend, I come to church, and I'm over here, and my hands are in the air, and I'm like, all right, God, if that's what you want, then that's what I'll give you. Do you see how that works? It's the authority of Scripture. I don't shape it according to my preferences. I allow it to shape me according to what it says. This is why over and over and over again, I want you to look at the language, and I would encourage you this week, spend a little time in Psalm 119. I have spent hours in Psalm 119 this week. And what I've been just overwhelmed with is again and again and again and again, the writer of the psalm is talking about precepts, rules, laws. Like, these are actionable things. A law is not just an idea or a suggestion. It's a law. You, like, like, this is a command. And the writer is saying, I delight in these commands, these precepts. Every verse, again and again and again, it means this. That if the scripture is only penetrating your mind to about here, but it's not making its way through your actions, it's not hitting you yet. I've learned something in the last, I don't know, couple of years. God's been working in me, and this is what I've learned. I'm, my passion is to see people worship God from their heart. That's what our mission is about, introducing people to the real Jesus. And the reason is because I kind of went through the motions in my life for a long time. And I had reserved part of my heart while sort of giving God some outward performance. And, and what that resulted in for me is a kind of pulling back from anything that sort of pointed at performance or action and really focusing my preaching and teaching and the emphasis of what we've been doing here at Church on the Move to the heart. But I want to say something in contrast to that. I, I haven't, I, I still... My story is my story, and I understand what God did in me, but, but here's what I've learned, is that God often gets to your heart through your hands, through your feet, through your butt, through discipline, like kicking your butt. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> you, you need this. I was telling our Lincoln parents this last night, like God gets to your kids through their butt, sometimes we need to be corrected in that way. And, and, and sometimes it's that discipline that, that does something in us. And so, so we dare not throw out application just because we're worried about the heart. There's a balance in both of those things. And so here's what I would like to invite you to do when you read scripture. How, how do I read it? Let me just give you something practical that you can do. When you read scripture, I wanna challenge you with this. Read it, and rather than asking this question, what does this verse mean to me, which is a terrible habit that American Christians have gotten into. Can I just tell you, the verses don't mean what they mean to you. They mean what they mean when they were written. I'm going to say this again. You don't get to read the Bible and go, well, this is what this one means to me. It doesn't mean what it means to you. Somebody wrote it with an intention. It was both God and man together in partnership. They wrote it, and they wrote it with an intention and to an audience. I like to say it like this. The Bible was not written to you, but it was written for you. So the Holy Spirit knew what would happen down through history and into eternity with the Scriptures. But when Paul is writing, he's not envisioning America 2022. He's not envisioning your exact situation. And yet, God can work and apply things in different times. That's the, 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 the transcendence, I'll say, of the scriptures. But, but hear me. They don't mean what they mean to you. They mean what they mean. So a better question for you to ask, rather than what does this mean to me, is how might this apply to me if I really believed it? What would need to change in my life if I really took this to be the truth? When you do that, you know what you're doing? You're humbly sitting under the authority of the scriptures and going, all right, God, I, 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 don't, get to, I don't get to bring my thoughts to this and say, this is my preference. This is my, my sort of point of view about all this. I need you to shape me. 
We become the clay and we allow him to be the potter. How might this apply to me? And when you do that, God starts working in you in ways that, honestly, that's when change starts to happen. The necessity of Scripture, the authority of Scripture, and lastly, the freedom of Scripture. There's a big misconception in our culture these days. The misconception is that freedom can only be attained through the shedding of all boundaries and limits and labels, anything that might impose its will on me, I need to get rid of it. It's called absolute negative freedom. Freedom from everything that might kind of go behind me, anything that might want to impose its perspective on me. And we see this playing out right now in our culture. You can see this. Even our very biology is now seen as a limit on what I believe is most true about me in here. And by the way, that's an interesting shift that's happened in human uh, and mankind in the last, I don't know, two, three hundred years is we now believe that the most true thing about us is what we feel inside. It didn't used to be that way. But we now take our personal feelings, perspective, we call it our identity, and this somehow is the most true thing about me. And so anything that would put a limit on what I feel about myself has to be removed, and we, we got to get rid of it. Absolute negative freedom. But the scriptures don't posit freedom in that way. I want to read a couple of verses from Psalm 119 again. Where are these? Let's see here. Here we go. Psalm 119, 44 and 45. I will keep your law. It's interesting to me that the word law here is connected to uh, what he's going to say in verse 45. I will keep your law continually forever and ever. And look at for, verse 45. And I shall walk in a wide place for I have sought your precepts. I want to point you to one more verse, verse 96. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. One of the big critiques about Christianity is that it's too narrow, that our views are limited, narrow. We gotta open up our minds, culture would say. You gotta, you gotta stop being so narrow-minded about who's in and who's out, and who gets to go to heaven, and who doesn't. You gotta be, stop being so narrow-minded about sexuality, about gender. You gotta open up your mind a little bit. The critique is that we're too narrow-minded, and that we need to somehow broaden our point of view. This is what I was talking about with absolute negative freedom. We need to shed the limits and constraints and boundaries that have been put on us by this ancient book. But you know what I've found? is that freedom is more than just the removal of restriction. Freedom is actually and can be found in limits and boundaries. I learned this as an artist. I, I, many of you may know that when I started here at the church, I didn't start as a pastor. I started in the arts department and worked in that field for a long time. In fact, I thought I would be an artist for the rest of my life, graphic designer. I was a filmmaker, musician. This was my passion for many, many years. And one of the things that I learned and working both here at the church and working for other clients that would hire me out from you know, all over the place, that the worst projects I ever worked on, ironically, were the ones where I had the most quote unquote freedom. The ones where they said, you know what? You're awesome, just do whatever you wanna do. I hated working on those projects. Talk to anyone with an artistic bent, they will tell you the same thing, that to just be left alone with a blank canvas, do whatever you wanna do, is the worst. The best thing is when someone has a clear, concise, focused vision and you know what target you're trying to hit. You understand this if you've ever followed anyone. When you have a leader who doesn't know where we're going, where everything's kind of vague, it's not as liberating, ironically, as when you work with somebody that goes, this is where we're going, this is what we're here to do. Isn't that interesting how that works? That through limits and restrictions, there's liberty. The same thing works with God's law. When we embrace God's truth and law about us, we find ourselves, what the writer of Psalm 119 says, in a broad place. 
in a wide place. In other words, there's freedom in saying, I don't have to figure out. You know, what's happening right now with young people, particularly who have been raised in this kind of soup that says, you gotta figure out who you are. You know what I'm seeing? is an epidemic of anxiety, and no wonder they're trying to figure out everything about themselves from the biological level on up. What kind of pressure is that on a generation to figure out your identity, both biologically, sexually, let alone the gifts that I have, trying to understand all of that, then like maximize it, realize all of it. I, I was in the mall years ago and I saw, the, just, a, just a few years ago, and I saw a little girl, I don't know, maybe eight years old, walking through the mall, holding her parents' hand, and she was wearing a t-shirt that said, be your own hero. And I thought, what kind of pressure is that for an eight-year-old? Be your own hero. There's freedom in going, you know what? I'm not the hero of the story, Jesus is. I'm not the master, I'm the servant. When I submit under him, there's liberty in going, what is it that you want me to do? There's a, there's a joy in that, there's a rest in that, there's a peace in that, because now I no longer have to figure everything out. The reason that we're stressed is because we're trying to do God's job for him. No wonder, the burden is too heavy. So when we come to him and we say, all right, what are your rules, what are your laws, what are your precepts, let me live by those, even if they don't make sense to me, what you'll find is that there's liberty, there's freedom in that. And let me just tell you this, the idea of absolute negative freedom that you can be free of all restrictions is an illusion anyway. Because even if you could remove all the demands and obligations that everyone else would put on you, you know two things would happen. One, you'd be utterly alone. Because there's no way to live a life in relationship without someone putting demands on you. That's what it is to be in a loving relationship, is you have to submit your preferences and desires and perspectives to someone else. So you'll have to be alone if you want that. And then number two, what you'll find, gosh, that thought just left my mind and I can't think of it. Come to me. <laughs> Well, there's another thought in there somewhere, and it was good. Just trust me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do notes, and this is the risk. So from, from time to time, this happens. There was a good thought in there. What was it? It was something around freedom. Uh, it's not possible to... Oh, yeah, you know what you'll be? You'll be a slave to your own desires. There it is. You will end up... Thank you. Thank you. You'll be a slave to your own desires. That, that, that's the idea. The idea that you can just somehow shed all obligations, it's not possible. Because in the end, you'll just be following your preferences. And if you've ever done that for long enough, you know that that's not real freedom either. It's slavery. I want to end with this, and I'm going to invite whoever's back there to come play. Someone back there is running, scrambling right now. Marcos! <laughs> Marcos is awesome. He's been around here forever. We love Marcos. I want to close by uh, reading the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11. Freedom. Jesus said this in Matthew 28. Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We love this verse. It's true. There's an offer to you, to me, of rest. But I want you to look at how he frames it. Look at verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. What is it? That's Psalm 119. I submit to you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Bob Dylan said it like this, you're gonna have to serve somebody. The question is who? You can serve Jesus, his yoke is easy, and his burden is light, or you can keep going it your own way. Find yourself in deeper and deeper slavery, because that's where it leads. The narrow path that Jesus offers leads you to a broad place, a wide place, a place of liberty and freedom. 
The wide road leads to destruction. Jesus offers rest. Will you take it? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes tonight? Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for these words preserved down through the centuries that shape us, change us, mold us, form us into your, your likeness, your image. Lord, tonight, we just pause here for a second. And church, I think we should do this together. I know many of you, you read the scriptures regularly. Some of you, you're like me, you believe them. For many years of my life, I was like this. You believe them, you just don't engage them all that often. Tonight, Lord, we just make a commitment, a reaffirmation of our commitment to dive into your word, to be people of the book. Even when we don't understand, we're gonna keep showing up. We're gonna keep reading. We're gonna say, I don't, I don't understand this, but Holy Spirit, we're asking you to illuminate these texts. I'm asking you, Lord, to connect us in relationship to mid-sized groups, to COTMU and a small group, someone in this congregation, Lord, there are people who can illuminate these texts for us so that we can grow in our capacity and ability to understand scripture, to rightly divide the word of truth so that we can be changed and transformed. Lord, we need that, we want that, so tonight we commit to spend more regular time with you in, these, in your word. We want to see you, we want to know you, we want relationship with you. And we know that you've made a way for that through the scriptures. We submit to them in Jesus' name. Now heads bowed and eyes closed, you're in the room tonight, you say, Wit, I am not living for Christ like I should be. Maybe you believe in Jesus, but he is not the center and Lord of your life. There's a difference between 90% and 100%. And maybe you've given God part of your, your heart, but you've never really gone all in. You've never really completely submitted yourself to him. And tonight you're saying, I want to make that decision. If that's you, you're in the room, I would love for you to do this. I'm going to pray with you and for you in just a second. But would you take a step? And I think it's so important that you do. Would you take a step just by waving your hand at me and saying, what, that's me, I'm ready to go all in for Jesus tonight. I, I need that kind of relationship with him. Just wave at me, I wanna be able to pray with you and for you here in just a second. But if you would, just wave at me and say, what, that's me, I'm gonna hold here for just a second, I wanna give you an opportunity. I know on Saturday night we got a lot of people here who, this is your regular thing, so I understand this is more of a believer service, but I always like to give this chance for you to say, I wanna make Jesus Lord of my life. Anybody at all, you're in the room tonight. Where, over here, guys? Yep, I see you right there. Front row of the risers, thank you. God bless you. Anyone else, you say, Wit, that's me. I'm ready to submit my life wholly and completely to Christ. Anyone else, I'm gonna pray here in just a second, but I don't want to miss you. Awesome. All right, let me pray here for you. Father, thank you. Thank you for meeting us right where we're at. For drawing us into relationship with you, for convicting us so gently as you do. We, we, we know, Lord, that you're drawing us to you in love because you care about us. You're not mad at us. You're not arms crossed up in heaven. Your, your, your face shines upon us. Thank you. Father, tonight I pray that for uh, this, this lady that's raised her hand, Father, those that will raise their hand throughout this week, and I pray, Lord, you would give them a next step, uh, connect them into the life of this church so that they can continue their walk and relationship with you. Here's what we're going to do tonight, church. I'm going to ask you and invite you to pray with me out loud together. Whether you raised your hand or you didn't, just repeat this after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to be my sacrifice. I confess... I'm a sinner, I need a savior. Jesus came for me. I believe he was raised from the dead and I confess Jesus is Lord. Lord Jesus, I give you my life, my past, my present, my future. I am completely yours. Thank you Jesus for saving me. Amen. Look up here. 
if you raised your hand or if you have raised your hand in the last few weeks or if you have a prayer need, here's how we're going to end our service tonight. We're going to have our prayer team down front like we usually do. And uh, if you need prayer for something, anything's going on in your life, here's what I'd love for you to do. Would you stop by here? We would love to be able to agree in prayer with you and um, just meet you right where you're at, help you find an answer to whatever it is that you're going through, all right? So as we close, you can go grab your kids if you want. The team will be down here for a few minutes, but uh, we would love the opportunity to pray with you. That's if you raise your hand or if you've got a prayer need tonight, all right? Stand to your feet. Don't forget, next week, Becky Pippert will be here. I am so excited about this, and I want you to be here. Don't miss this next week, and it's going to be a great weekend. All right, here we go. We're going to close our service as we always do. Let's put our blessing up on the screen. Say it out loud together. You ready? Here we go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you next week. You're dismissed.